I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to our Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations program. We are presently witnessing the sixth mass extinction, this one due to human-caused climate change and environmental destruction. Understanding this crisis requires a comprehensive perspective, one that includes species within the context of both habitat and biodiversity. Our guest today has precisely this approach. Michael Reed is professor of biology at Tufts University and also adjunct professor in the Tufts Department of Infectious Disease and Global Health. He is known especially for his work on birds and their habitats, and he also studies characteristics of species that predict their potential adaptability to environmental and habitat threats. Dr. Reed, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, uh, and I'd like to start by asking, maybe we better find out what is mass extinction as opposed to ordinary extinctions would happen all the time. Uh, would you give us a little background on that, please? Uh, sure, uh, mass extinctions are just um, higher than background extinction rates that happen in a much shorter period of time. So over the last 500 million years, there have been um, typically recognized five mass extinctions. And they're notable because in each one of those, somewhere between 75% and 95% of all the species on Earth disappeared. Now, this sounds crazy, um, but it's also notable that there's a lot of extinctions in between the mass extinctions as well. So these events are notable by their relatively short uh, time span with all the disappearances. And they often... Um, covered entire geographic ranges at the subcontinent level with entire genera of species disappearing, like all the trilobites, for example. Yeah, and dinosaurs and things like that, right? Yes. Well, except for the birds, yes. All the dinosaurs except <laughs> okay. the birds. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but it, all of those mass extinctions in the past were due to natural causes. And in the sixth mass extinction, this is due to human beings. So it says, ironically, that if humans became extinct, the rest of the planet would be just fine and might thrive. But humans are destroying many, many uh, genre and uh, species, uh, many creatures all over the planet. And so this is a very serious thing and will be for uh, humans as well, I guess. But so can you give us an idea of what the situation is, just in general, the number of, of uh, of genre and stuff uh, have been uh, destroyed so far in the sixth extinction? Yeah, it's, um, we can't be exact about it mm, because yeah, right. we don't know how many species there are on True. it. True, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we have to estimate that. But current estimates are that species are disappearing at about 100 to 1,000 times faster uh, than they are in a normal background extinction. Uh, some estimates are higher, some are lower yeah, because yeah. of the different ways they estimate species disappearances. Yeah, so it's pretty tough. And uh, for most of us, certainly right here, we don't see it every day, so we don't know what's going on there. But one of the things that goes with this is biodiversity and how important that is for life forms in general. Um, can you give us an idea about that, why biodiversity is so important and the ecosystems in general? Well, sure. This, If you just look around, what humans need to survive are resources. And a lot of times species are the resource. Uh, so they're providing food. Um, also, they provide ecological services. Now, they don't do that as a favor to humans. It's incidental to their existence, but they're, um, they're supporting services like producing oxygen and mm. um, creating soil and things like that. And 
regulating the climate. Now, the loss of any one species is probably not going to have a very notable effect, mm -hmm. uh, but there's a famous analogy from a book from 1981 called Extinction by Paul and Ann Ehrlich that likens yes. the loss of species to popping rivets out of an airplane. You know, maybe one rivet <laughs> won't be so bad, although with recent airplane <laughs> yeah, <crashes>, right. <laughs> maybe we're more concerned than we were. But eventually, depending on what the species is, you know, what, what rivet it is, the effects are accumulating and cascading. Right. Uh, and now within this, the, the need for biodiversity, I think we're not entirely uh, knowledgeable about that in a general way, why species depend upon each other. And you sort of alluded to this, that uh, your, their food supply, uh, their, their need for maybe plants or the, that interdependence between plants and animals and insects and so on. Can uh, an idea of can you give us an example, for example, how that's important, what this interdependence? Well, it might be easiest to think of nature in an area as being a, a web of mm -hmm. interactions. Mm -hmm. So um, certain species eat other species. Um, woodpeckers will eat uh, larvae of insects under the bark of trees, and they also depend on the trees to excavate cavities to build their nests and reproduce. So if the, cav if the trees go away, then the habitat goes away. Yes. Um, if a predator disappears, the things that are eaten by the predator might actually get really abundant. There was just a report out uh, in the last few days of a study done in urban parks in Belgium that noticed that in green space, which we create to make people happy and feel better about the world, if there weren't predators there, rat numbers skyrocketed and disease outbreaks were higher. Yes. So there's a, a lot of very complicated relationships and we often can't predict them ahead of time because they are so interrelated. Yeah, that, that, thank you very much for that. I was gonna say there are two things that the loss of insects now, one of them, of course, maybe has gotten some publicity as say honeybees, but insects in general upon which birds and many other creatures depend for food and so on, that loss of insects, which is kind of obvious, is, uh, is devastating and has this uh, spillover effect on from one species to another uh, as well. So th it's really serious. Uh, Dr. Reed, I'd like to ask you also that uh, we're not aware of mass extinction sometimes unless they're right on top of us, uh, you know, unless we see something right in front of us. But things like the Amazon right now or tropical areas in general, could you tell us what's happening and why that's important that? Well, there's an awful lot happening, but to, but to just make a quick reference to your comment about, we don't see them right in front yeah. of us. It's really hard to see. And mm -hmm. frankly, how do you know when the last individual has disappeared? Yeah. And you know, unless your job in life is tracking all the individuals, you won't notice it. Yeah. And, and a lot of declines like here in New England uh, there was a publication a few decades ago that said, hey, eastern towies, they're super common, but I haven't seen them in a while. I, I must have just forgotten to write them down. And what they discovered was they'd been declining rapidly for 20 years and no mm. one noticed it. Yeah. Even when we're keeping track, it's hard to notice. Yeah. Um, now I forgot what the other thing you asked yes. me was. Yes. <laughs> well, but for areas, we think of these things oh, that we don't sure. notice unless it's right on top of us. And then, but some areas of the planet that are being devastated, like the Amazon and loss of species there, has an effect, I think, that's a lot sure. larger. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we, are, we seem to be more concerned about extinction in the tropics. And I think there's a good reason for it is species richness is very high yeah. and species ranges are very small. So um, probably one of the most influential lectures I ever heard as a graduate student was someone who was talking about plant species in Ecuador. 
and he spoke for 30 minutes and showed slide after slide mm -hmm. of plants and said, um, all these species went extinct last month because they were endemic to one hillside in Ecuador mm. and they plowed the hill. So often very small ranges. And you know, if you want to think about interconnectedness at the planet-wide level, clearing the rainforests in Brazil is having an effect on rainfall in Western Europe. Yeah. Because it actually affects the, uh, the, hyd the hydrologic cycle and water circulates through the atmosphere. Um, so some of these are more obvious, some of them are just predicted, and others are happening as we, as we watch. And uh, yes, and th there are, th so I wanted to get that uh, across. Uh, uh, thank you very much for that because of the, it, it's long range. A lot of these uh, effects are long range apparently, and so that's a big problem. Now you are a specialist in birds, and I'm not sure whether it's migratory birds, but birds in general, and the loss of birds in this extinction has been enormous. Can you tell us what's going on? Sure, it's um, birds are, well, birds are the best species of from course. my perspective. <laughs> um, many of my colleagues who work on other taxa disagree with me. Right. Um, in the world of endangerment, if you look at the uh, IUCN red list, birds are doing better than most taxonomic groups with only about 12% critically endangered and things like amphibians are at 41%. Mm -hmm. But birds are uh, very noticeable. They have a lot of public interest in them. Uh, migratory species are having have to deal with problems at their wintering sites, at their breeding sites and along migration routes. Mm -hmm. Species that live on islands are particularly at risk because they tend to have small abundances and have evolved often in the absence of predators. So when introduced species show up, they don't, don't have the evolutionary wherewithal to deal with them. So I think birds in some ways are a bellwether for people because they are noticeable. And we have some of the best data out there over the last few hundred years for birds because the old naturalists um, would note right down birds they saw. Yeah. So we've got a very good information on them. And like I said, the public likes them. So when they disappear, uh, it's more noticeable. A lot of mammals are nocturnal. So unless you're out there trapping them or you're working at night, you see them less frequently. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I've seen was that, uh, and now I can't remember the source for it, but that about two-thirds of North American birds are at risk uh, for uh, extinction. But in either case, the, that would be a large number. There's another aspect of this that there are birds that are migratory, and there are some problems. I think mean, that creates problems by itself. Is that true? Oh, sure. Um, I don't know about the two-thirds number because yeah. it all depends on what you mean by at risk. Yeah. Now there, and there's no right answer to at risk. Okay. The IUCN has its own categories. A recent paper by Paul Ehrlich and colleagues uh, yeah. said anything with fewer than 1,000 individuals they view as at risk. Um, migratory birds uh, it's, can be uh, are a great example of the need for... Uh, collaboration between governments to try and save a species. So, for example, uh, some of the bird work I do is in Maine, and the, a lot of the birds that breed there overwinter in the southern U.S. or Central America or South America, and you could be doing fabulously protecting birds on the breeding grounds, but if their wintering grounds are disappearing or if they're being heavily yeah. uh, hunted there, then their numbers might decline, even though you're doing really well in the breeding grounds. So you need to protect each stage, uh, each portion of the of the life cycle of the species. Yes. And there's been a lot of interest lately on looking at the full annual cycle of species and seeing how they relate across the 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 year. Yeah. Uh, another thing with the migration. It, it is apparently that if birds are migrating long distance, then they have to feed a lot on the way, and some of the things they feed on are 
already gone, like insects or whatever, uh, uh, mm -hmm. or plants that or seeds that they might require. Um, and is that the case also that this is messing them up, that the different areas of climate change are messing up migration? Ah, yeah, so climate change is actually uh, messing with migratory species in more than one yeah, way. Right, right. So one of the ways is altering food abundance and availability, but other things like um, uh, human harvest of, say, horseshoe crabs and things like that are affecting migratory red knots. Uh, but the one, one of the causes of concern right now with climate change is that it changes what's called phenology, so the timing of things through the season. Mm -hmm. So when a migratory bird comes back to the north to breed, it, ex it has evolutionarily set to come back at a particular time when there's food available. Yeah. And uh, particularly food available when their eggs hatch and the chicks come out. And with these species um, in the higher latitudes where they breed, Budding is coming out earlier, so plants are budding out earlier, which means insects are coming out earlier, which means uh, insect pulses are coming earlier. And if the bird is migrating because of a change in the length of daylight, it doesn't know this, mm -hmm. and it comes back, and all of a sudden, it's at the tail end of, um, of the food supply instead of right in the middle of it. And some species uh, of bird have shown shifts in how early they come back, but these might be species that uh, migrate based on their local climate in the wintering grounds rather than daylight. So some birds are shifting and some are not. So when you think about problems with migratory species, it really depends on the species and what the threat is. Yeah, and I, I can see that as can be a big problem. Now, you specialize in birds. Can you tell us a little bit about your work? Oh, sure. I've uh, over the years, I've worked on a variety of species uh, on, say, islands in the Caribbean, a, a lot of work in Hawaii, and I also work, have worked in, say, Nevada, the Mojave Desert, and New England, and I'm interested in general in how human alteration of the landscape can affect the abundance and risk of bird species and what might be done to reduce that risk. And some species with climate change are doing better. Mm -hmm. you know, if your habitat gets bigger or one of your competitors disappears, you might do better. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I'm, I'm particularly interested, I think, in island species because they are traditionally more at risk. And Hawaii is the extinction capital of the world from a bird oh. perspective. And um, you know, so it's both heartening and depressing right. uh, to work in places like that. Yes. Uh, why is why is it so concentrated there? And, uh, and like, what are humans doing or climate uh, doing that are that uh, might be causing the issue? Sure. It's it's a whole suite of things, and they're all entangled. So let's think about Hawaii in particular. So humans show up and they bring their uh, pets and food, you know, pigs and rats can't come with them. And the species on the island don't do well with new predators. And a lot of um, island species have evolved to be flightless and naive to predators, and they're easy to kill. Um, there's small areas. Uh, in Hawaii in the late 1800s, mosquitoes showed up. And mosquitoes carry diseases that the birds don't have defenses to. Oh. So mosquitoes wipe out birds below a certain elevation. And one of the problems right now with climate change is as the island warms, the mosquitoes are creeping higher and oh, higher on the mountains. And as you go up a mountain, as you know, the area gets smaller. And at the top, there's no place to go. So there's a, a whole myriad of, of threats that all um, are entangled. And humans are at the root of a lot of it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, humans need resources to live. And I think the, the key is figuring out how to um, benefit 
humans with a minimal effect on the biodiversity. Yes. Well, since humans are so destructive of these habitats and of, of, of just wiping out the biodiversity, perhaps, uh, what would be your suggestion for solutions on, say, in Hawaii? Well, if there were any easy solutions, we'd have taken care of them. You think? Okay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, what I feel like needs to be done there and other places is people need to figure out, as a society, what do they want? If they want species to persist, then they need to figure out how to how to tackle those problems and solve them. And one of the things I've certainly seen in different parts of the country is there's often a lot of activity by a certain group of people that are interested in conservation, mm -hmm. but instead of working with everybody to solve a problem, they just work with people that share their values. And I think the problems are big enough that we need to figure out how to work with people that we even disagree with uh, on other issues to help solve problems because they're they're too big. And I know in this current political climate that looks difficult, yeah. but I would like to remind at least younger viewers, when the Endangered Species Act was revised in 1973, the congressional vote was 394, yeah. uh, 390 in favor and 12 against. So there was a time when people with different philosophical values could work together to solve problems. And I think we need to find a way to, to get back to that. And, and I don't know uh, what that way is. Yes. Uh, on that, we just have a couple of minutes left. But it seems as though, right, for many of these things, environmental issues, the climate issues, many of these issues, um, there actually is a need for, say, governmental uh, 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 a policy to impose, to protect these things. Uh, and uh, are you in that school of thought? Do you believe that that would help if we had a policy set and rules set, laws set to protect? No, we already do. Uh, uh, I, think, I think what we need is a more of a political will to enforce them. And, and more of a social will to sh show people the benefits to them of, of protecting them. It's not a, um, um, it doesn't need to be a heavy handed top down approach, but I think you need grassroots and you need top down. Yeah. They need to work together because if you're trying to solve a local conservation issue, if the local people aren't behind it, it's going to fail no matter what the rules are. Yeah, so I think we need both. Yes. And some of the fastest things that are happening in the world, uh, say in energy, is happening in China, where they have a very forceful top-down approach. But I would not say that the uh, people of China are necessarily benefiting from it as well as they might be. Right. So it and, can't uh, just be a heavy-handed yeah. Well, no, I didn't mean heavy handed. I meant that it, what I've seen is oh. that a lot of like uh, industry and so on is able to go in and wipe out areas or uh, chop down forests and all like that. And you might need to have some rules rather well, than just the people. Yeah. But uh, in any case, we just we're about finished here. I'm sorry to say. I'd like to hear much more on it. I hope you will continue your uh, a long, many years of hard work on uh, preserving species of birds, in, in your case particularly. And I thank you very much for joining us today. Well, I really appreciate being invited and having the opportunity to talk. And don't hesitate to email if there are follow-up questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you, I'll make a note for that. Thank you.